So if I can hand over to Frank, who has ex been exploring first hand a number of different enhancements. Uh, so if you want to talk us through your adventures. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so my name is Frank Swain. Uh, I'm a science writer, um, current new scientist that I write for the BBC and many others. And since about my, well, probably about my early 20s, I've been going deaf. Um, who knows why? Probably went to too many gigs, probably a combination of that and bad genetics. But uh, yeah, so I, I noticed this around about the same time I started living uh, with my girlfriend, and she would say, oh, that car alarm's really annoying me. And I'd say, oh, I'm really hard on and noticing that I would always turn the TV up a little bit more. And it's very insidious, deafness is very, very insidious because it comes on very, very slowly. And the brain is fantastic at compensating for that. So most people who have some kind of hearing loss do, don't realize that they have it for a very, very long time. And I went to, uh, to get some sort of ear defenders fitted, these, these expensive, fancy, noise attenuating uh, earplugs because a lot of my friends working in the club have them as well, so they're quite great. And the woman there insisted on doing a, a hearing test while I was in there. I just wanted to do a hearing test. And she did the test and put you in the little booth and everything. And he's done them. They put you in a sort of soundproof booth with the headphones. And they said, press the, press the uh, little button when you, hit, when you hear the beeps. And I said, yes, OK, no problem. And she said, yeah, press the button when you hear the beeps. And I said, yeah, OK. And press the button when you hear the beeps. And I said, yeah. And she said, OK, test so. over. Um, and it turns out that at that point she said, we don't normally see this level of hearing loss in people under 40, which is a bit of a blow when you're 25. Uh, so that was very really sad. And of course, I did what everyone does when they first find out they're going deaf, which is to ignore it. And so I ignored it for another five years. On average, it takes about 10 years from going from needing hearing aids to actually getting hearing aids. Uh, but eventually, uh, about 2012, so a few years ago, um, I finally sort of said, OK, I'm going to have to get some of this. It became very difficult to to hear people speak. And the strange thing about going deaf is that you don't lose all of your hearing across the board equally. It's not like the sound goes down. You actually lose clarity. So you lose the four kilohertz region. Uh, most commonly, that's the one that you will lose first. And that's the vocal region. So although traffic sounds just as noisy and uh, people clattering on chairs and backgrounds and all of that, all of that sounds the same volume to me. But the people, their voices, it sounds like that's been turned down. So if people aren't facing me, uh, they talk with their back to me. I won't be able to tell what they're saying. The clarity isn't there. I tell them they're saying something, but I can't say what they're saying. So movies, for example, going to the cinema, a bit rubbish for me because the cameras often aren't focusing on the character whilst they're talking, and I can't tell what they're saying. Uh, I see a lot of foreign films because they have subtitles. And stuff. I'm down with that. <laughs> uh, but when I did get my first hearing aids fitted, something very strange happened, which is I began to hear phantom noises. So I first got them fitted. Everything sounded completely bizarre. It sounded like. Uh, if you ever had it, if you played around with your stereo and you turned the treble way up and the bass way down, it sounds very tinny. Uh, that's what it sounded like. It sounded like the whole world was inside a tin shack. And I complained about that. I put them in. The doctor said, How do they sound? It sounds terrible. It sounds like everything's in a tin shack. He said, Excellent. That means they're working perfectly. The problem is, my brain had gotten used to hearing things uh, in a very, very subdued way. And now that it was hearing these particular ranges amplified, because it had already compensated for that, it heard things as being very, very tinny. It was balancing out. So it took about a, a year probably for that to be completely gone. It took about, not too long, about a few weeks for it to, to adjust. The brain was very, very cool at adjusting. Um, but in that time I'm walking along and every time I step it sounds like there's a milk bottle falling on the ground. And when I kick a leaf it sounds like a crisp packet. And uh, you know, a guy would open a, a soft drink can on the side of the room and it would sound like a rifle shot. So it was a very, very strange experience. And eventually all of that settled down. And immediately I wanted to see how I could play around with them because the interesting thing about hearing aids is that they don't just, it's not like a clear trumpet, it's not like they're amplifying everything and it's not even that they're amplifying particular ranges that I can't hear very well. They have some crappy microphones, I say crappy, they're very good microphones. Uh, they have some microphones, they listen to the world and then they make judgments about what part of that sound, that noise, is useful information and what part is just rubbish. And so it wouldn't help very much if my hearing aids amplified traffic noise or the murmur of crowds in, you know, in a big room. And so they tried to dampen that down and a huge amount of processing, so hearing aids are very, very expensive, um, a huge amount of processing goes on in a very, very small device trying to discern what is useful information and what is noise. 
computers can't really tell the difference. Hearing, hearing, knowing the difference between music and noise is something that only human brains can do. It's something that happens in our heads. And so trying to teach a computer to recognize what is speech and what is uh, running water is very, very difficult. But eventually they did them, so I have these now and I'm very happy for them. But I thought if I'm going to listen to an interpretation of the world, which is really what I'm listening to, I'm listening to what the, my hearing aids think is important about the world. It's an interpretation, it's an editorialization of the world, world around me. How far can I push that? Um, to give you an example, if you have very advanced hearing aids, they do fun things like if you were to pick up the phone, for example, uh, it would tell it from the quality of the voice on the other end that you were on the phone, and then it could pipe that voice to both ears. So you picked up the phone, but you would hear the voice in both ears, and that's kind of easier for people to, to hear if you're, if you're losing your hearing. That's really weird. And that's not something that's in reality, that's kind of an improved version of reality. And similarly, if uh, you couldn't, if you lost your high end, for example, it would take a lot, it's a lot easier on your ears, rather than amplifying high end noises, is to pitch shift them lower. And so, for example, women's voices might be pitch shifted into a lower octave, not massively, they could go around something like Barry White, but it might push them down just a little bit so that you, they don't have to amplify that sound as much and it's much easier on your ears. So again, this is kind of this interpretation and changing things around with the audio landscape around you. And I think that's really, really interesting. So how far can you actually push that? Uh, I decided that I would push it very, very far and I would make, hack my hearing aids so that I could hear Wi-Fi and hear Wi-Fi fields around me. And there's a few different reasons for this. Uh, this is, I don't know if anyone recognizes this behind me. This is an artwork by an artist called Timo Arnold, and what you're seeing there is a visualization of Wi-Fi fields in the urban environment. And it was a very cool project, a um, very popular project. That kind of aesthetic has been stolen by a lot of people doing BT. You've seen the advert with the, you know, things going around the streets. And what happened is they made a big LED, stick with LEDs on it, and they flashed, and they rode a bicycle around, and the number of LEDs that were flashed depended on how strong the Wi-Fi signal was. And so you can see in the middle there, uh, the Wi-Fi drops down, and then probably into someone else's route or someone else's field, and it pops back up again. And I think that was a really cool idea, and the point of doing that was that Timo Arnold was trying to make these infrastructures that are invisible, infrastructures that we rely upon every day of our lives, all of you here have a phone in your pocket, most likely, um, and you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you may be scrabbling around for a Wi-Fi password when you came in here. You rely upon it every single day, but you have absolutely no sense of where these fields are. No one in here, unless you've already been told, knows where the router is that your Wi-Fi is connected to. Uh, none of you can point in the direction of the phone masks around here, even though you're actually relying upon that infrastructure at the moment. And I find that very, very interesting because it's like you know, catching a train or driving somewhere and having absolutely no concept of the other streets, only the one you're on, not even knowing how many streets you pass, you know, from your home to work. So if we go to the next picture, we'll see what's in there. Uh, I'm trying to make you my skivvy here, I need to push it. <laughs> there we go. So there we go, that's the person walking along with the LED stick, so you can see how they made that along the stage of the photo. Uh, and this is a development of that idea of, of again, making these invisible structures, infrastructures visible. And a few, you can tell I'm kind of like into my art. This is James Rydell. He did a, a very famous project called Jerome Shadows, uh, which again is, is this idea of sketching his outlines of drones on the ground to make an invisible infrastructure visible. So how do I hear uh, Wi-Fi, how do we go about this? I'm very lucky in that there has been a very recent <coughs> development in hearing aid technology which is to make them network. And so it used to be that they were analog, then they were digital, and then they had these sort of radio connections and you could wear a little uh, dongle around your neck and it would use that to piggyback a signal. There was a Bluetooth box here, it would connect to your hearing aids using the radio, because radio is very low power and there's very much things with batteries the size of an aspirin. You can't put much power in there. And that will connect to your phone. Now, Apple have been very, very nice, and they've developed a new codec on the low energy Bluetooth that's used for connecting to Fitbits and possibly to Google Glass, I'm not sure. Uh, then this very, very low power Bluetooth now can connect my hearing aids directly to a smartphone. And so that's a really interesting idea because they were doing this and saying, oh, this is fantastic. Now, if you wear hearing aids, you can hear your phone call straight into your ears, you can pull the phone up, you can stream to it, uh, you can do a there's a battery interface and a kind of like you mess around with the settings and things like that. It becomes a kind of control panel. 
that's very, very limited, I thought. There's actually, once my ears are connected to a smartphone, I'm really connected to the entire internet, the entire world through my ears. And so how, you know, what can we tinker with that? How can we change that? What can we do with that? And so this idea developed to, to, uh, to become sensitive to Wi-Fi. My phone is sensing Wi-Fi all of the time. It senses the fields around me. And I sent, you know, and I have to use these hearing aids all the time. I have to wear them all the time. I'm obligated to. So I worked with a guy called uh, Daniel Jones, he's a sound artist, and we got a grant from Nesta, and also a company called Starkey, who make these uh, very fancy hearing aids, which I think is all really expensive, probably the price of a, a first-hand Fiesta or a second-hand Fiesta, um, gave to someone to us for free, which is very, very nice. And so, I, because obviously you can't hear what I'm hearing, I'm going to play you the sound of Wi-Fi fields. And the sonification is... You know, it doesn't have to sound like this. You can make it sound like anything you want, obviously. Uh, but this is what we made it sound like for now, if hopefully we want. So. so this is the sound of the Wi-Fi around you right now. Okay, I know, and the question is, some people are laughing at that. That's going to get really annoying, isn't it? <laughs> Um, possibly, absolutely possibly, but the interesting thing, as I told you before, was that when I first got these fitted and I heard these phantom noises and I found it very difficult, you know, everything sounded weird and, and intrusive. In the same way, that's, I'm hoping that as my brain adjusted to that, I'm hoping that my brain will adjust to this as well. Um, and there was a very early on in, in this project, in this idea of hacking my ears and, and adding some kind of extra informational layer to my audio landscape was that we didn't want to go for some kind of discrete information like we seen before with the, you know, you look at a painting and it tells you something about that. This is a, that's a discrete form of information. But that doesn't really exploit the brilliant part of hearing aids, which is that you have to wear them all the time. They're there all of the time. So what kind of uh, information is only really, can you only really make sense of when you're aware of it all of the time? Uh, information that's continuous, information that is dynamic, and that's environmental information. And equally, I could have, you know, I could have set this up so that as I walked in, it would say, "There are five Wi-Fi fields in this room, and this is their names, and this is the strongest one." But I didn't really want that. I wanted to use this data in a way that to make it into a sound that I myself had to interpret, and I had to learn to interpret. And so the goal is that when you have those melodies, those melodies are the identities of the, the nearest routers and that crap in the background is really just the number of signals around. And the hope is that that hearing element comes in. So this is about taking data and say, infusing it into you and just trying to make sense of it and seeing if it changes the way you interact with the environment, the way you interact with it, everything. If I maybe we'll go for a chat and we sit in this corner and I say, no, we can't sit here because it's really noisy. It's quiet to you, but to me, it's like it's a terrible spot because there's there's a white up here and interfering in that in a irritating way. So that's really my idea and that's that's where I'm pushing this idea of, of wearables. Uh, Google Glass is something that leaves me a little bit cold because I find vision very, very narrow band. You cannot read two books at the same time. Your vision, you can only really focus on one thing at any one time. It's very, very narrow band. It's very, very precise. It's very, very good. You know, our vision is fantastic. But we can only really focus on one thing at a time. Whether it's your hearing, uh, it's a bad example here because I'm the only one making any noise. But if we were, you know, if there was a crowd up there having lunch, if there were some people mumbling in the back, all of those sounds would be going on. There could be music playing. All of that could be happening. And you could hear all of that and be aware of all of that. At the same time, you could focus on me and only listen to me. And yet, if the music stopped, if the crowd noise stopped, if somebody screamed bloody murder, <coughs> something happened to that, you could instantaneously become aware of it. Your, your attention could shift and you could focus on that immediately. And so hearing is a fantastic broadband uh, way of adding information into your world and you know, around you all the time. And so I think as we look at this idea of saying, okay, we're going to um, be wearing computers all the time, you know, enhancements are going to become part of our person, Hearing to me is a much, much more promising avenue to add in increased amounts of sensors, increased amounts of data to your lives and vision. If you, you can only spot so many pop-ups in front of your eyes before it gets too distracting, but sounds, you can keep on adding them, even if you don't listen to them, they can be there and you can be aware of them on some lower level and then snap into focus when you need to. So uh, that's my project, thank you very much.